Hello, I'm David James. Edward and Regina Recknick and their only child, Irene, born in 1934, were from large families and were part of a Jewish community in the town of Dubrovia Gornicia, in an area of Poland bordering Germany. It was also less than 30 miles from Oswiecim, the town the Germans called Auschwitz. Before World War II, Edward managed a coal mine owned by his father, and the family was prosperous. In September 1939, the Germans invaded the Brovia Gornicia and surrounding areas. The Rechnicks, along with the Jewish people, were forced out of their homes and into ghettos. It was a miserable existence. There was the constant fear of being selected for transport to Auschwitz or being shot for no reason at all. The Rechnicks lived that way for five years with conditions and treatment worsening all the time. In early 1944, Irene's father, Edward, found a place to hide Irene among Gentiles in the home of a mine worker who knew Edward and the family. The family was paid to take Irene into their home as a hidden child. Irene Reckness' story is one that's so hard for people to really imagine um, was reality. Um, she was one of thousands of children uh, who were known as hidden children. It, it's an unbelievable story and we can only imagine what that does for a child. To, to be taken from your parents, to go into a home with strangers, to fear for your life, to not know what's happening to your own parents and family. Edward and Regina were transported to Auschwitz where they were selected to be workers. As Edward later recalled, those deemed unfit to work, including mothers with small children, were taken immediately by truck to the gas chambers where they were murdered. Regina recalled years later and said, we saw them go in and not come out. We saw the flames night and day. We smelled the burning bones. They lived under constant threat of being killed and were forced to watch executions of other prisoners. Early in 1945, the Germans began to move prisoners out of Auschwitz ahead of the Russians, advancing from the east. Nearly 60,000 prisoners were forced on death marches with little food, water, or clothing. Uh, it was in the winter of 45 January. Virginia's sister, my aunt, Leosha had also survived the camps I thought to that point. And they they marked during the march. Uh, Le, Leosha, if you fell behind or you fell by the side, the Germans were shooting the people who had fallen. Uh, Leosha was, was not able to march. Her, her feet were frozen. But uh, so Regina was holding her up while they were walking towards uh, on the road. At one point, uh, Leosha was thirsty and there was snow all around. She went, ran to the side of the road and scooped up some, some uh, snow that she, she was eating or drinking. Or, and the, the German guard came over and shot her. And uh, Young Regina told me at that time, Leosha was in my arms. I had support, I'd helped her all for years in the, 
and then came so she could get some food and and if she was dead. And uh, a minutes later, the, the German guards jumped on trucks and took off. They left everybody on the road. She could have survived. General Eisenhower informs me that the forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. When liberation came and World War II ended in Europe, the Rechnicks were survivors, but they had nothing. The Rechnicks had lost their home and all material possessions. They were displaced persons and had to find each other and then Irene. After reuniting, the family of three moved to Belgium where Edward received extensive medical treatment. After eight years, they were able to immigrate to the United States and settled in Evansville, Indiana, where Edward's sister was living. Regina worked in an office, and Edward had a menial job cleaning at a factory. Then one day, Edward gathered some scraps of material from the floor of a clothing factory operated by a friend. With the help of his sister, he began making boys' pants. That was the beginning of what became Edward's manufacturing company. The business grew over time and became very successful. Irene, a teenager when the family moved to Evansville, graduated from Bossy High School and then obtained an undergraduate college degree from Evansville College. Then she went to New York City and New Jersey to work as a translator and a language teacher, always a lover of learning. Irene went to the University of Wisconsin in Madison for an MA in French then progressed to working on her PhD in French literature. Sadly, she was never able to complete her PhD because in 1982, her mother, Regina, a Holocaust survivor, was killed in an auto accident in which she was a passenger with a group of women. Then Irene returned to Evansville to care for her father. Edward died of heart failure Three years later, Irene never moved from the house she had lived in with her parents since they arrived in Evansville. Irene Recknick was our neighbor for 25 years. She was known for smiling, for her wit, and for her quietness. I never got Irene to open up about her experiences uh, during World War II. We've been videoing World War II veterans, and from what I have found with talking to many of their family members, they usually don't talk. Their experiences were so horrible that some of them pushed it behind and they didn't ever want to talk about it. I think that's what happened to Irene. It was difficult for Irene to think or talk about the years of the Holocaust. Yet she strongly believed that the memory of the Holocaust, all its horror and what her family and many others had endured under the Nazi regime needs to be remembered as a caution today and in the future of what can happen. She told me how much she wanted uh, to make sure young people did not forget the Holocaust. And so she said, I, I want to know the best way to keep this alive. And I think it will be by having some sort of lecture series at the USI campus. Thanks to her generosity and her kindness, uh, every fall there will be a special presentation here on the campus. Two children of the Holocaust, Simon and Irene, cousins who survived the horrors of World War II. Their message, never forget the millions who died and how it happened. Sadly, Irene passed away July 19th, 2022, two months before the inaugural lecture. I'm David James. Never forget, never again.
Funding for this program was made possible through a gift from Anne Blanford in memory of the Rennick family.